Okay, this, we are in uh, episode number 29 of uh, Commandments of the New Testament, and uh, we're taking a, a little respite today. Um, I uh, talked with Steve about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, last time we got together a long time ago for breakfast. Um, the, uh, the question has come up, uh, not from our group, but outside. If we are studying the commandments of the New Testament, uh, what does that have to do with love? And uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, the, uh, there are an awful lot of, of things that we could say about love in the New Testament. And surely that's the, the uh, preeminent thing that is discussed in Christian circles, love, the love of God, or the love of um, uh, one Christian to the world, in fact. Um, I can... Uh, I can trace most of this back to uh, Mark 12:30, and there are similar uh, passages in all of the, the Gospels. And uh, but this is Mark 12:30, and thou. This is Jesus talking now. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now. First of all, you need to know that this isn't the first commandment. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is using a Greek word. He wasn't speaking English. He's using a Greek word here that's been translated first by the King James translators. It doesn't mean the same thing that we think of first meaning today. Uh, first, the first commandment as far as the Jews were concerned, and that's what Jesus is referring to here, the Jewish commandments. The first commandment was, you shall know that God exists. That's the first of the 613 Jewish commandments. There is a commandment among the Jews uh, in the, from the Torah that has to do with, uh, you shall love the Lord your God. Uh, what commandment do you think that is? What number? No. 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 I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. Oh, okay. I'm oh. talking about the 613. Oh, it's 77? No, it's number seven. Number oh, seven. I figured there was a seven in somewhere. <laughs> the answer is always seven. Always seven. Always seven. Okay, so the first commandment is not a reference to the, the beginning or the initial commandment. It's a reference instead to the greatest commandment. And in the Gospel of Matthew, it's specifically translated the great commandment. So this is the, considered by the Jews to be the greatest commandment uh, uh, in priority and in importance, if you will, uh, rather than the first commandment in the sequence. The, the Christian church has picked up on the words of Jesus here and identified this, of course, as the most important commandment, the first commandment. And he goes on after this to talk about the second commandment, which is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two summarize all of the law and the prophets, Jesus says. Okay, um, the problem is that they are not the same thing as the law and the prophets. Clearly, there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Jesus was summarizing them. If you do these two perfectly and completely, which is technically impossible to do for any human being, but if you were able to do these two commandments, you would fulfill all of the law and the prophets. Just as the Ten Commandments that we are comfortable with, the Charlton Heston brought down off of the mountain. Uh, uh, I guess you're going to get mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two tablets of stone, uh, one with vertical commandments and the other one with horizontal commandments. Um, the vertical commandments were between man and God and the horizontal are between man and man. Uh, one on each tablet. They were not split five and five, they were split six and four, um, and uh, the two tablets uh, represented the summation or the summarization of the 613, once again. However, getting back to this, I, uh, 
I heard this when I was in Sunday school as a kid. I, uh, I grew up in a denominational Christian church, a variety of them. And uh, this was a favorite. Everybody talked about this. And this is what our job was. This was job one for the Christian uh, when I was growing up. The problem is that if you think about this, now think about these words. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. All of your heart. And all of your soul. And all of your mind. Now, all of your mind presupposes that there's nothing left, right? All of your mind is focused on loving God and all of your strength. Just about the time you achieve all of this, the phone rings, right? There is no way that you can do this. Why then would Jesus say these things? And of course, he was quoting from the Old Testament. God originally said these things 2,500 years prior. These things are the crux of this great, most important commandment. How could we possibly do this? And this is just the first, the most important. Okay, I puzzled with this. The question that, that I kept coming to was this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. I thought about this long and hard growing up in the Christian church. Now, I'm sure that other people had different difficulties with this than I did, but my difficulty, and by the way, I didn't tell anybody that I had a difficulty with this. We never do, right? All of us are perfect Christians, and to ask a question about something this basic betrays your lack of sophistication as a Christian, right? Your, your lack of Christianity, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. My question boiled down to how do you do that? How do you do that? And that's what I wanted to talk about today. How do you do this? How do you love the Lord your God? But how? You're supposed to do this. How do you do this? Not just how do you do it with all of your strength and all of your mind. And all. How do you love God? <clears throat> now, this reminded me of a, of a uh, uh, favorite story of mine growing up. I probably mentioned it before, but that's okay. Repeating is good review for all of you. And, and Frankie hasn't heard it, so that's okay. This is a, and Doreen probably hasn't heard this either. So, so she, yeah, she probably has. Um, it's a story of a, of a uh, uh, an old guy like me, and, and uh, he's, he loves to read books the kind you hold in your hand, leather covers and all this. He uh, loves to frequent old used bookstores and look at all of the titles and, and for 15 cents each, he can buy a whole bunch of them every time he makes a visit there and take them home and put them on, on the shelves. And, and he finds some really unique and different titles on some of these old books. This one he found, which was really interesting. And he, he saw that and had to look at it a second time. The title of the book is How to Hug. And he thought, now that might make interesting reading. Here's an old book, and the title of the book is How to Hug. So he spends 15 cents, buys this book, and he takes it home with him. And after he gets settled, he opens the book to, to uh, uh, read the preface or the foreword and, and try to get into the book and see what they have to say about how to hug. And it turns out that it's... Uh, volume 15 of a, uh, of a bookshelf encyclopedia. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's from, from how to hug. <laughs> so, so it wasn't what he thought it was, but he was, he was looking for an instruction manual and it turned out to be an encyclopedia. The, the, the interesting thing is that quite often our concepts of love are pretty much the same kind of thing. You're, you're, you're trying to love, and you never quite achieve it. Have you ever noticed that? It's, 
uh, you, especially when it comes to something like loving every person in the world. Good luck with that. But also, good luck with loving God. Now, I'm, I'm being painfully honest this morning. I had a real tough time growing up with this. And from time to time during my adult life, I've thought about this and, and tried to figure out how it might be possible to love God the way that Jesus said I should love God. It would have been so simple if God had simply written in his Bible how it is that you go about doing this. How to love God, and by the way, the, the subtitle there, and how to know that God loves you. That's the crux of this. How do you go about loving God? How do you cause that to happen, right? Uh, don't jump the gun on me here. <laughs> don't jump ahead, just follow this path. This is an important way to look at what it is that we're studying right now from a different angle, from a different point of view. And I want you to experience that point of view. So work with me on this. First of all, you have to know who it is that you're going to love. You cannot honestly, truly, and really love someone that you do not know. Now that may sound logical, but we go about trying to love God all the time and love Jesus all the time. But you can't do that. You can't really love someone until you know them intimately, intimately. And I'll caution you, you have to know them before you even try to love them, especially when it comes to God. Why is this a very incredibly important thing? And the answer is because if you attempt to love God without knowing him intimately, then you are loving a God different than the one described in the pages of Scripture. You're loving a God that is coming from your head, not from the pages of the Bible. You are loving one that you have created. And the Bible goes on and on and on to describe idolatry as an abomination before the Lord because you are worshiping a God of your own creation. Yeah, so we don't do this lightly. Don't try to love God if you've created your God in your own head. You have to learn what God has said about himself in the pages of Scripture. So you have to know God before you can love him. And I go a step further, you have to know him before you try to love him. The second thing is almost as important as the first thing. You have to do. You have to do. Now, this is something that I learned after I got married. Sharon was easy to love. Was? She was easy to love. She's, no, she, <laughs> she, still, she still is. But I learned something about love after I got married that I want to share with you. Because it, although you may know this down deep, you probably never brought it to the surface and analyzed it. Love is a one-way affair. Now, let me explain that. We live in a culture and in a Disney cartoon-oriented uh, uh, society where we believe that you, quote, fall in love. No, what you do is you fall into infatuation. You can fall into lust. You can fall into a whole bunch of things, but you cannot fall into love. Because that implies that love happens to you. Love doesn't happen to you. Love is not, listen to what I'm saying, this is important. Love doesn't come from the outside to the inside. Love comes from the inside out. 
Love is something we do, not something we receive. We can receive someone else's love, but that's because they are doing it. You see how that works? Love is a verb. It's something that you do. It's not something that you are the recipient of. Wow! You don't know. That's not love. Love is something that you send out, something that comes from the heart and goes out. Love only goes in one direction. How often does someone love another person, but it's not reciprocated? I'm sure you've heard of that before. It's in all the movies. You just watch some romance movies and you'll get the idea. Uh, the, the whole idea here, though, is that you can love someone and do that, and yet they don't love you. Love is a one-way street. Rarely, blessedly, sometimes you can experience two one-way streets going in different directions. So I love Sharon, Sharon loves me. But we are both doing this thing to the other person. You see how that works? We are both loving the other person, our spouse. Okay, now let's apply this to God. You've got to know God. We've already established that. But you also have to do love. You have to do your love. You're not the recipient of God's love. That's not what we're talking about here. How to love God is something that you do, not something that you receive. Now, God is going to love you too under certain circumstances. I was taught growing up in the church that God loves all men. You cannot escape it. It's everywhere, throughout the universe. God's love is an immutable fact. Whoever said that didn't read the Bible. The Bible goes to great lengths. God goes to great lengths in Scripture to love some and hate others. Now, I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> but loving God, from my point of view, my love is what I'm talking about here. My responsibility to love God with all of my heart and my soul and my strength and my mind, that's something that I must do. How do I do that? As I said, it would have been a whole bunch easier if God had simply told us how we can love God. If he had just written it into one verse in the Bible, how do I love God? And the answer, of course, is he did. And I never knew this growing up in the church because they don't talk about this in the church. The pastor never talked about this from the pulpit, and I never had a Sunday school teacher that said, this is how the God, God said, this is how you go about loving God. What is it that you do in order to love him? And if anybody knows, God should know, right? He's the author of all of this. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments, this is the New Testament. He that, this is Jesus talking. He that hath my commandments, Jesus has commandments. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them. Okay, this is almost a commandment in itself, isn't it? You not only have to have Jesus' commandments, you have to obey them. He that has the commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, if this was the only verse, man would have twisted this thing 77 different ways and made it all about himself rather than about God. But it's not the only verse. This is just scratching the surface of what the Bible has to say about loving God and how to accomplish it. This tells us 
that in order to love God, we have to obey him. And if you don't obey him, you cannot love him. And he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest, that is, show or reveal myself to him. That's heavy stuff. And the contrary is also implied here. And it's said specifically elsewhere. Now this is going to fall into the commandments of the New Testament. These are going to be the source of at least one, if not more, commandments that we're going to be talking about. So stick with me here. 1 John 2, 3 to 6, And hereby do we know that, that we know him. Now this is how you know that you know God, the true God, not one out of your own imagination, not something that's an idol that you created yourself. This is how you know that you know God if we keep his commandments. That's how you know God, you keep his commandments. Now, that's a, that can be a real stumper if you, to begin with, but the more you think about it, the more you realize, well, of course, of course. The, the commandments given to us, especially those in the New Testament, are not merely a moral code. They are telling us what God thinks is good and bad. Not what we think, not what, what our political party thinks, not whether we're conservative or liberal by nature, not what the society that we live in, in this case, Southern California, uh, not what we think, but what God thinks is right and wrong. You will never get there using your head. The only way that you can get there is by knowing the commandments and keeping them. And that's how you learn about God. You will never know God until you know his commandments. Now, during courting and dating, it's important for us to know what the other person likes and dislikes. You can't really be a successful person in a marriage relationship unless before you got married, you found out likes and dislikes and whether they were compatible or not. There are lots of folks, believe this or not, there are lots of folks in the world today that are not compatible with God. They, have, they want nothing to do with your God. They would curse your God and your beliefs in him. There are people who will even voice their opinions of heaven and hell. Oh, that's where all my friends are going to be, that hell place. And uh, uh, that's okay with me because that's where all my friends will be. And they make fun of it because they, they prefer to think that it either doesn't exist or it's not going to be nearly as bad as, as you're making it out to be. It's not you that's in charge of the definition of heaven and hell just like it's not you that's in charge of your definition of love and knowledge about God. Uh, let me back up here. And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, I know God, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. How many Christians in the world today Going to church today as we are today, how many Christians in the world today are liars by this definition? What? In order to keep his commandments, you have to have his commandments. And try to Google that sometime, the commandments of the New Testament, even just the commandments of Christ. And the best you'll come up with is here are the Ten Commandments of Jesus Christ. Or here are the 21 Commandments of Jesus Christ. We're going through the Bible right now. 
with the intent, specifically in the New Testament, of finding all of the commandments that we have been given in the New Testament. I haven't even scratched the surface, and I'm well over 100 now. I will be surprised if we fall short of 613. And there are lots of Christians who believe that there's only one commandment, to love. That's what I was taught growing up. And if that's your idea of the commandments of the New Testament, there's no way that you know God. And to say that you know God, you're making yourself a liar. And it's not me saying that, it's God saying that. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso obey his word, that is God's word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. You want to love God? You've got to know his commandments and keep them. I have been completely unsuccessful in finding a list of the commandments of the New Testament. And that's why we're doing this study. Unless you have the commandments, you cannot keep them. Unless you have the commandments to obey, you cannot know God. And there is no way that you can love a God that you do not know intimately because you have no idea what he thinks is right and wrong. What he has proclaimed is good versus bad. And, and we've discovered some really phenomenal things that I grew up not believing, not understanding. Just the idea. I, it still fascinates me that, that <laughs> I, I know what fornication means, sexual sin. I always have known that from the ground up. I asked my mom and dad, and they said that's sexual sin of any kind, fornication. And we left it at that because it's a, distasteful subject. We don't like to talk a lot about it, all of the different things. Even though the Bible does talk about that, we skip over that part of the Bible because that's distasteful stuff. And we do ourselves a disservice every time we do skip over those things because we do not learn what it is that God thinks is important. It stunned me. And I was 40 or 50 years old before I discovered that it is not just a sin, it is an abomination before the Lord. And part of fornication, for a man to marry a woman, divorce her, marry somebody else, divorce them, and come back to his original wife and marry her again. And I thought, wait a minute, that was Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And everybody in the church was so excited when Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor got remarried after all of that time and all of those other spouses. Isn't it wonderful that they got married? No, it's an abomination before the Lord. And God is the one that told us that. And we don't know it because we don't know what those commandments are. There are just a whole slew of commandments and we were in hot involved with that last week when it came to judging others. How many Christians are convinced that Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged? And that's the end of that story. Jesus did say that, but he wasn't talking about what you think he was. What is it? Who is it? Uh, not what you think. Exactly. <laughs> um, Princess Bride, yes. Whoso obeys his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. By this know we that we are in him. This is how you know that you are in God, if you are keeping his commandments. And you cannot keep his commandments unless you know what they are. Second John 6. Uh, the reason that there's no chapter is because there is only one chapter in 2 John. This is a, a short letter that John wrote at the, toward the end of his life. Uh, and this is love. This is the definition. You've heard all kinds of definitions. Philosophers and uh, 
uh, poets have been trying to define love for centuries, right? For millennia. They've been trying to come up with a definition. Here's what God says in the Bible. This is love that we obey his commands. You heard it. <laughs> this is what God says. This is how you love. You obey his commandments. Now, of course, this love is specifically between you and God. But he goes on a little bit later, and we'll get to that momentarily. Don't, don't think that it doesn't apply to everybody else, too. This is the commandment that, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should obey it. Now, I can remember in from the pulpit being taught that this commandment that it's talking about is love. But it's not. The context of this clearly is obey. This is the commandment that you must keep in order to love God, you must obey. It is a commandment to obey the commandments. Jesus said in John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Whatsoever is a $10 uh, early King James English word for everything. That's what it means, everything. So you are my friends if you do everything I command you. Good luck with that one, by the way. Do you want to be the friend of Jesus? You've got to be a friend before you can be someone who loves the Lord. You cannot love the Lord without also being a friend. This is another thing that I learned in marriage. You don't marry someone because they are lovable. You love them because they are your best friend. Your best friend. And you are convinced that you are marrying your lifelong best friend. You will never have a better friend than this. Love is a result of that, that kind of relationship. Best friends. Jesus here is talking and he says, you are my friends if you do everything I command you. Now, I have to admit, when I saw this kind of stuff being talked about in the pages of Scripture, I was faced with what I considered to be a contradiction, love versus obey. I had always considered these two things as polar opposites. How can you love someone and have to obey that someone? And of course, yes, and, and your fathers, your fathers, and your mothers. And your mothers. Yeah, you don't you don't truly get the idea of love and obedience being one and the same thing until you have a family. And when you have a family, you suddenly say, "Oh yeah." Oh yeah. 1 John 3:22 and whatsoever we ask, we will receive of him. Now when we ask, this is obviously a reference to prayer. Okay, whatsoever we ask in prayer, we will receive from him because we keep his commandments. You ever wonder why some prayers don't get answered? God says, God says over a dozen times in scripture, I will refuse to hear the prayers of an unrighteous person of a sinner. I refuse to even hear the prayer. I'm not even, it's not a matter of considering the prayer or not. I'm not even going to hear it. I turn my face away, he says. <laughs> I will not listen to the prayers of an unrighteous person. Now, my first thought is, how about all of those non-Christians out there praying? There's only one prayer that God will hear from, a, non, from a, a heathen or a pagan or whatever. But there are Christians that he will not hear either. And in most contexts where he says this, I will turn my face away, he's talking about Christians. 
He's talking about the brethren in the church, in the New Testament. I will not hear your prayer. If you come to me with unclean hands, if you are unrighteous, how do you become unrighteous? You sin. What is sin? It is the disobedience of the commandments that God has given us, that we don't know what they are. So everything we, and everything we ask, we will receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. It's important to know what the commandments are if for no other reason that we can then to, to understand what he considers pleasing and what he considers displeasing. John 15, 9 to 10, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. That's straightforward enough. This is Jesus talking again. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Continue ye in my love, he says. Now that's just the context for what comes next. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, Jesus' love for his Father is contingent on the same thing as ours, keeping the commandments of our Heavenly Father, keeping the commandments of our Lord. We talk about Jesus as being our Lord and Savior. Those are two different things, right? Savior is one thing, and Lord is something else entirely. How do you make him your Savior? You trust him. You believe in him. How do you make Jesus your Lord? You obey him. If you don't obey him, he is not your Lord. He that keepeth God's commandments dwelleth in God and God in him. 1 John. This is New Testament stuff. This is not the Old Testament that we're talking about. If you love me, keep my commandments. John, speak, John 14, this is Jesus talking. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we don't even bother to learn what they are. Oh, we know the Beatitudes because there are some cute songs about the Beatitudes. Be ye meek, be ye uh, happy, uh, and on and on and on. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus is, is being poetic about this, but what he's saying is, this is my family. My family consists of those who do the will of my Father in heaven, who obey my Father's <coughs> commandments. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? 100% of all Christians are going to say, you betcha. <coughs> then keep his words. Obey the commandments. What commandments? Well, there's more of them than we know at the moment. And I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm concerned about this. And you should be too. By this we know that we love the children of God. Now this is interesting. This has to do with the horizontal aspect. We're told that we are to love all of our brethren, all of the world. We are especially to love those within the church. And that's not an easy task. Because there are some folks in the church that are hard to love. Nigh impossible to love. And I'm being honest here. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Isn't that fascinating? The way that we know that we love God and the way that we love all other Christians is the same thing. We keep the commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. That's again the, the definition. The definition of the word love is tied 
inextricably to keeping the commandments of God. Not just for our love of Jesus or our love for the Father, but also our love for other Christians. You cannot love the church unless you are keeping the commandments of God. That's what this is saying. And his commandments are not grievous. In most cases, the commandments that we have discovered so far are not grievous. They are simply a matter of knowledge. This is right, this is wrong, as far as God is concerned. Not as far as our government is concerned. Not as far as our culture is concerned. This is about what God thinks not what is politically correct. John 14, he that loveth me, I'm sorry, this is uh, Jesus speaking once again. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. This is the, the contrast here. If you don't love me, it's because you're not keeping my commandments. If you are not keeping my commandments, you don't love me. Does this concern you like it concerns me? Growing up trying to discover how to love God, and remember that's the objective, how to love God. I, was, I spent way too many years going, love, 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 trying to make it happen, you know? and I had missed the whole party. And I'm not alone, although nobody likes to admit this. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Jesus says this many, many times during his public ministry. The things that I'm telling you, that is, the commandments that I am giving you, are not my commandments. They come from my Father in heaven. He gave them to me that I might in turn give them to you. These are New Testament commandments. They have nothing to do with the law of Moses. These are New Testament commandments given to New Testament Christians that follow Jesus Christ. If you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you look to him as Lord and Savior, you have to be obeying the commandments, and you have to have the commandments in order to obey them. Being made perfect. Now, this is, this, the Bible doesn't stop short of twisting the knife. And this is where it gets really sketchy. Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. If you are not obeying him, hmm, what does this imply? Now, if this was the only verse, <laughs> again, we could twist it in such a way that it was okay because there are other verses that talk about salvation by belief. There are more, by the way, more verses that talk about your salvation is dependent upon your obedience to God's commandments than there are your salvation is dependent upon your belief. But that's a whole different sermon. One of his disciples came to Jesus one day and said uh, he had been thinking about this a lot, uh, this, this matter of salvation and getting into heaven. That's what they were immediately concerned with. How do I get into heaven? You know, and Jesus is always talking about, this is the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. One of his disciples came to him, and it was apparently in private, and he asked this question. But it was overheard by uh, several of the other disciples, Matthew and Mark in particular. Mark was a young boy at the time, and he was a follower, although he wasn't one of the twelve. Uh, Matthew was one of the twelve, and Matthew and Mark both write about this. Luke was a Gentile. He wasn't even around. A Gentile physician. He was uh, away uh, at the time of all of this, and he picked it up later. He was a, a writer, a historian. But in Luke, 
he tells the story. Then said this one unto him, this disciple unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Now, I've been asked this question, and I have asked this question before too, and I'm sure you have too. Are there going to be a whole bunch of people going to heaven or just a few people going to heaven? And as a pastor and as a Bible teacher, I have taught in the past and been wrong in teaching it. I have taught in the past that there are going to be a lot of people going to heaven. There are going to be more people than you would imagine. When we get there, we're going to see people who we were sure were never going to make it. And I've heard other pastors say the same kind of a thing. This is not what Jesus answered, though. Jesus said, in response to this question, he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Straight is an old uh, English uh, word for narrow or small, the little gate. Okay, Strive to enter in at the little gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Let me summarize what Jesus said. He said, yes. The question was, are there few that will be saved? And Jesus' answer was, yes, very few people will be saved. And then he goes on, when once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and you, speaking to his disciples now, and you begin to stand outside to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, and he, that is Jesus, shall answer and say unto you, I know you not. Lord, Lord is the, are the scariest two words in Scripture. There are, there have to be thousands of Christians at this moment in time all over the world that fall into this group, that fall into this category. And we should be afraid. What is it Solomon said? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of of the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 to 27, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, this is again Jesus talking, not everybody that calls me Lord, 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 shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, he that obeys the commandments. If you don't obey the commandments, the implication is you're not going to heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and have in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? This is in the name of Jesus Christ that he's speaking. And this is Jesus talking. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I, Jesus, profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You work iniquity because regardless of what you think you're doing, you're not obeying the commandments of my Father. You will not be saved. You will not get into heaven just because you said three magic words at a Billy Graham crusade. And then Jesus says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? This is Jesus saying, have you thought about the word Lord? Why would you call me Lord and disobey me? That's a contradiction. Lord is, is a master. It's a master-slave kind of a relationship. Jesus says, you can't call me Lord and then ignore what I say. 
<clears throat> That's reserved for employees, not for slaves. <laughs> Jesus in Matthew 12, 11 uh, says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is a famous passage, right? All of us have heard this lots. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What yoke? You ever thought about that? My yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Or, or oxen, or oxen or like that. that's, yeah. That's the yoke that pulls the blade pulls the, the plow or the wagon or whatever. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Two things: you take my yoke, my burden, if you will, the burden that I place on you. Take my burden on you and learn of me. Why is it important to learn about Jesus? because you cannot love someone that you don't know. God in the Old Testament, God the Father said, learn of me. It's one of the, the, the 613. You shall learn about me. In the New Testament, several times, Jesus says exactly the same thing. Learn about me. It's a commandment. It's one of the commandments of the New Testament. Learn about me. We only learn about what we want to know about Jesus. And we'll make up the rest. And that's okay with us. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is talking not about his personal burden. He is talking about the burden that he's going to lay on you, the yoke that he will lay on your shoulders. That's a light yoke, and the burden is going to be easy. The commandments are not that difficult. It's a matter of knowledge, not the resistance to sin. That's a whole different issue. And that is the commandments of the New Testament. And that's the reason why we spend so much time, as we have during the last several months, looking into the commandments of the New Testament. This is an important thing. And I, I wanted to present it to you today. Steve and I have talked about this. And as I said, the question of love versus obedience has come up. They're one and the same thing. And God is the one who says so. You cannot love him. You cannot love Jesus without obeying what he says, without obeying the commandments. Even if you are not a Jew, whether a traditional Jew or a messianic Jew, a fulfilled Jew, if you are not a Jew at all and you're a Gentile like we are, you are still responsible for knowing the New Testament commandments and obeying them. And if you don't, the implication is clear from Jesus' own mouth. And Jesus is the one that we are calling Lord. Okay, enough said. This is a, this is a tough one, but I wanted you to get a flavor for why we're doing this. It's, it's an attempt to love God, and that's the reason that we're studying the commandments. We want to love God more fully. I have been praying as part of the prayer for our services over the last, how long have we been doing this now? 20 years? Yeah, before that too. I've been praying that God would, that God would teach us about him, that we might know more about him, that we might love him more. Obedience is the reason that we need to know him. And we cannot know him, according to Jesus, without, without, we cannot love him without knowing him, and we cannot know him without obeying his commandments. It's a step, stepping stone kind of a process. And God is, 
not saying this in one or two verses. He's saying this, and this is just a summary list. There are lots more passages in the New Testament that talk about this. Some of them are pretty sketchy, pretty difficult, and pretty scary. We all want to go to heaven. We know what the alternatives are. And none of them are what we want for our future. So we want to love God, and we want God to love us. The way that he says we can love him is to obey his commandments. And that's why we are doing this series on the commandments of the New Testament. Let's close in prayer. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear.